This is the What Do You Really Do podcast with your host, Dr. Santo Riva. Dr. Santo talks to kick-ass business owners, doers, and creators to learn what it's really like in a day in the life of. Dr. Santo is the owner of Victory Performance and Physical Therapy in Culver City, California. He's the creator of the Victory Method, which has helped thousands of people get out of pain and back to their normal lives. And he is hell-bent on putting the care back into healthcare. Today, we're talking to professional comedian Brent Gill. We talk about the business of comedy, his talent show debut, and what makes for a great comedy show. Uh, hey, what's up, Santo? Hey, we My- have <laughs> we have funny man Brent Gill here. Hi, everybody. I hope I make you laugh. I'm not going to try, but if it happens incidentally, hell yeah. That's, but that's the life you live for, right? <laughs> that, is the, that is my life. I have a weird life. Anyway, you know this. We're not going to talk about half the things we've talked about within these dojo walls. walls. <laughs> <laughs> no, pay, uh, definitely patient, client, confidentiality. But, you know, you'll probably talk your way right into it anyway. I anyways. probably will. I'm really bad at this. Okay, so uh, tell everyone who you are. My name is Brent Gill. Uh, I am a transplant to Southern California from Denver, Colorado. Uh so while most of the Californians are moving to Colorado, I am f- uh, kind of on an exchange program. Uh, I moved out here in 2017. I'm a comedian and a show producer. Um, I've been doing that full time f- for three, going on four years now. Uh, yeah, going on four years. I started comedy back in 2006. That's what I say, at least. It was really like 2004, but I don't count that. So I was high school stuff doesn't count. Whenever people tell me like they're a comedian, it's the worst. I hate telling people I'm a comedian. Well, because people just want to say like, tell me something funny. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. It's the worst thing, <clears throat> and it's common for like a lot of us to like. Like this is not a common trope with with comics. Uh, if it's if I'm in a situation like on an airplane, uh, I'll say something like, you know, I work at a head shop. Like I sell bongs and they will shut right the fuck up. Um, I will sometimes I'll say I work at like Apple. Like I'll just go through old jobs I've had because Apple was my last real job. And then they get interested in Apple and then I'll be like, I haven't worked in a lot like three or four years. So it it just, you know, it's a lot has changed. You know, you might just want to call Apple care. (laughs) <laughs> and then I, and then I get out of it because the last thing they want is someone dabbling with their phone and screwing their phone up, you know, at a bar just because like my calendars aren't working. Why are my calendars thinking? Where are my pictures? But the Ugh. problem is you still wear your, your Apple Genius Bar shirt. I do wear Apple stuff, <laughs> but that's just because it's hip out here. I, and I wear it to work out with you. It's not like I'm really wearing it in public. But it makes me want to give you my phone and have you fix my calendar. I'll wear it at a, on an airplane for sure. Because when my eyes are half-masked and really red, they're like, oh, he's a professional. <laughs> <laughs> so but do you have like a one-liner when like people tell you, come on, funny guy, tell me something funny, make me laugh? Yeah, most times it's not appropriate. It's like, normally what I'll say is... Uh, something along the line if I really don't want to do it I'll be like you know I don't tell short like like one liner jokes I tell kind of stories bits you know two three four five minute chunks and it's kind of like a whole like experience like a setup you know and this is not the right location for it I'd love to and then half the time I'll, I will have already had made them laugh do, just being me or they will like in the in the next two minutes I will get something out of them with, I'm not even trying. It just happens. And I'm like, see, look, you're having fun already. Like, you're already having fun. You don't need to hear one of my jokes. Go on YouTube. Go get one of my two albums. Like, there's, I got a lot out there that will make me a lot better in your mind than if I just was like, oh, okay, here's a joke. Uh, I started mixing White Claw with Truly, and I call it Truly White. See, that's not fun. Like, I don't even it's, know what truly is. Truly, it's all hard seltzer bullshit. It's uh. like dumb stuff like that. My favorite one that I used to go to was uh, I stopped calling my condoms condoms. I call them dream catchers. <laughs> Keeping the nightmares away. But that's not appropriate at a mall uh, in Ohio, you know? So 2006, what happened? 
Did you get you like well? Two thousand six. The funny no, bug. no. It uh, so two thousand six is when I did my first two minutes at Comedy Works. That's just why I say that May of two thousand six. Uh, I have the date in there somewhere. Um, but I in high school I was in the gifted and talented programs, so we were able to do if you had a certain grade like GPA, and it's it's really like you didn't need any. Like I could have graduated early, but I was like ah oh, whatever. Uh, so I took a independent study class. And uh, I did it on being a comedian because I was already into it early. Like, st- com- like it was like ninth grade or something like that. Like, like whenever Dane Cook was getting his first half hour special, uh, Carlos M- Mencia wasn't stealing material yet, um, and uh, Chris Farley was like, you know in his heyday well the latter part of his heyday you know what i mean and so that those were my influences so i always like mimicked farley and and, you know stuff like that and then my so that's why i did the independent study independent study uh led to my discovery of comedy works because i wasn't old enough to be there i couldn't do it yet so i ended up doing uh, a show at my talent show uh which is Sounds cool until you realize that these are everybody that you know. These are all the people that you go to school with. You have to see tomorrow. If you eat it, <laughs> you're screwed. So uh, I did that. It went really well. That's when I was like, yo, this is great. I almost threw up before I went on stage. It was pretty crazy. Uh, but like, that's when I was like, this is cool. And it was very me oriented. It was very like our experience of the school and stuff like that. It wasn't like it's like set up punchline tag it was it's always been for me the style of comedy i have it's very conversational it's very like we're hanging out you know um and i i try to just keep you visually engaged as well as audio audioly audibly engaged as well in my type of comedy so what was, what was that journey like for you to <laughs> i mean be you were in high school you said right yeah and then to today, like what what's gone on for you to get here, where you're like really like you're a oh, full time comedian, a lot, <laughs> and you know and everything. I'm 34 right now, so just to put that into perspective for everybody. Uh, so from like 17 or 18 on, uh, here we'll just do this. So I'll say so. I did the show in high school, then I uh. Last minute organized a one man show in the basement of my dorm room in college at uh, CU Boulder, and then uh, in Colorado, and then had a bunch of people come down. Probably like forty, fifty people come down. I literally went on everyone. I I walked the whole building. I knocked on everyone's door, and anyone that answered, I was like, "Hey, I'm doing a one." This <laughs> this is freshman shit. I'm doing a one man show, uh, comedy show in the in basement. Get as high or drunk as you can or want and meet me down there in an hour. And I did that to the whole dorm. And it was on like a Friday or Saturday. And whoever was there and wanted to came down. And I literally was up for an hour. This is the second time that I'd done comedy. And um, and then third time I started, I went to an open mic uh, at this play, at this brewery in Boulder called the Redfish, which I now run a show, my most successful product thus far, in like the building right next door. It like shares a wall with this place, so it's I have this whole nost- on the same day of the week, so I've got this nostalgia for that too. But so I did my first open mic there, then I went to uh, I started going to a couple open mics, and then I went to I did my first two minutes at Comedy Works in two thousand six, and then from there. It was just grind until I eventually like I've I've gotten to open for Dave Chappelle, uh, and I mean like, re, like literally open. It was me and Chappelle, and then Ron White dropped in, so it was me, Ron White, and Chappelle. Uh, I've done Red Rock, Rocks twice, which is nine thousand plus people. Um, I have uh, a small spot on Vice Land uh, where most of my jokes got cut. Uh, but not all of them. Uh, and then uh, that show I run in Boulder. So uh, I 
I've run multiple shows that have failed, and the one, my most successful one is the one that I did do in Boulder, Colorado, called the Boulder Comedy Show. Super original name, but very Googleable. Seven years ago, geotagging was like in its height, and it still is. Like that's how people search. So and so near, you know, physical therapist near Culver City, near eight hundred two one eight. You know, whatever the, the the you know you search. So it was like Boulder Comedy Show. People are going to search Boulder Comedy, and um. The restaurant was brand new, so we came in six weeks after they opened, and as they grew in popularity, we grew in popularity. I had already been doing it for six years already. Um, I started the show in 2013, so I was better, much better at doing comedy and having being a host. Because the host will make or break a show. I have made and broken so many good shows because you're the first taste of what they get, uh, of what the show is. They don't know, to them, to some of them who never come to a comedy show, you are the a representative of the establishment. You're not a comedian. You're just like here to be like, all right, everybody, we're going to start the show now. Is everybody ready? Okay, we're going to bring up the comedians now. That's who they think you are. And they're, you know, so... Uh, it really took a great skill and a lot of time to learn how to host so well to where people started coming for me. And then it wasn't about who was on the show. It's the show is always great. And I was there. I did did the show every week for five years straight before I moved. And I still go back at least once a month to tend to it. And I still book it and promote it from here and run it from here and do everything myself from here. Except I have a guy named Jeff Tice on location that hosts and does my door most of the time now, although he's gotten super busy in his own right. And that's what's great about the show is it really builds that host spot really. I mean, it's a lot of exposure. I'm going to see 10,000 people at my show this year. Um, and you know, it's a great exposure and experience for these comics. And the fact that he's grown as fast as he has in two years, that's exactly what I wanted. It sucks. I have to find a kind of a, a replacement slowly but surely because now he can only do about two weeks a month but uh it was well worth it that's a lot of information so this is, but this is a it's interesting because this is kind of like the business of comedy and i'm sure this is one no one thinks of this stuff what do most people think that you people do think that i sleep till four at in the afternoon and then Sometimes I don't sleep till four. I, I'm a fan of not getting up before double digits. I'm I'm a big 10 a.m. fan. Uh, 9 a.m. I'll like wake up and I'll lollygag in bed till 10. Uh, and then people think that we just like sit around, get high all day, don't and w- play video games, uh, and then go d- to just tell jokes at at night. And that's what a lot of comics do for sure. Like I'm not gonna lie, I got a lot of friends that do that, uh, but. If you're, if this is your business and this is your job, you know, it, it, the 80, 20 rule falls in line with so many things in life and just business in general that it's just like that. Like 80% of my day is dedicated to just bullshit. Like spending three, four, five hours editing a video and making the thumbnail for it and trying to think of a good title and what time am I going to post it? And, oh, in the meantime, I get distracted by all these emails and I still have to book myself. So I have to send all this these emails out and I got to get a good tape. So I got to watch the tape and I got to keep it updated. And now it's corporate s- season because we're in November right now. <clears throat> so trying to get gigs for the holidays. So who am I going to send those out to? What kind of companies am I into or would be into me? Uh, How's my social media look? When was the last time I posted? What can I post today? How can I keep them engaged? Uh, What's how do I get people to my I mean, I can just keep going. My website's not up to I can just keep going and going and going. And it that's what a professional comedian does in the daytime. Throw in writing throw in throw in uh you know podcast or like creating extra stuff it's not you can't just do comedy anymore carson doesn't invite you over to the couch and your career's made forever that's why 
it's funny that like clubs from the 80s and 90s are like, man, comics don't party like they used to. It's like, yeah, we can't because this can't be the only thing. We have to wake up at 9 a.m. and do a voiceover recording or do an audition or do a podcast recording or do whatever it is so we can bring in that side income uh, so we can and still try to generate fans because now name of the game is butts and seats. If you don't put butts in seats, then you're getting the the minimum wage of comedy, which is longer to explain than normal, but that's an easy way to you know say it. So it uh, there's so much. Oh, and then the twenty percent is the night is like the funds. Like that's what you love. That's the fun stuff. That's the you know I get to go try this material. I get to go hang out with my friends. I get to go drink and get stoned and go work. That's pretty cool. It is a pretty cool job for sure. But it's also still like if you're going to do that, you can't be the guy that, you know, gets too drunk or gets too stoned and then screws everything up and then gets that reputation. And, you know, so it's just it's a lot. Also, like 80 percent of my shows don't generate money. 20 percent of what I of my shows generate 80 percent of my income. It's it's nuts how, how this works. So it. I always kind of tell people that, that there's so many things that you don't see me doing that I'm, you know, doing. Like, <laughs> post your stories. What are you doing today? I'm staring at a computer screen for nine hours. Do you want me to do a, a time lapse of that for you? Like, <laughs> I, I don't know what to do. Like, yesterday I just posted, hey, I've been doing boring stuff all day. If you want content, go to my YouTube. See you tomorrow. <laughs> like, I can't. I can't do it all the time. I need an assistant. I need an editor. I need a team. You know, I have the vision on how to take my brand to the next level, but I just need the people and money to do it. What do you think is stopping you from putting a team together? The amount of time, it'll, uh, two things. Uh, I've been screwed too many times and not screwed like financially, but more like I'll open up. And I'll explain how things like people want information and I have information and I don't have a ton of money. So it's a lot of like, hey, you help me and I'll teach you. Like, I'll give you a lot of tools to, to do this on your own. And then they get that information and they're gone because I give it all to them too quickly because I'm like, here's what I'm doing. Here's here's the thought because I want them to think big picture, too, with me. And then they just so I'm like jaded. Like, I don't want to go find, like I want someone that, you know. I want someone that wants to charge me 20, 30 bucks an hour, but I want like, like, I'll, like I want that quality, but I want the price range of an intern from college. You know, I, I don't mind paying people money. I don't have a lot of money, but now that I've stopped paying the bill here, uh, I can, I have some extra cash and I'm like, I'll give some, you know how much money, like a 500 bucks a month would mean to a, to a college kid. But I need them to do the quality of, of that work. And if I give them everything up front, what's to stop them from like, all right, well, I got what I needed. I mean, I college credit, I guess. But that doesn't really matter for some of these kids. I've got some suggestions for you, but we could talk about it later. Yeah, I, I'd love to hear it because what I'd love to do is be able to not fo spend three hours of the day figuring out a fo how to Photoshop or what to photoshop for a freaking thumbnail on youtube and then change that for a thumbnail on the podcast and then change that for the thumbnail on the instagram like yeah i, I, I gotta do three different variations of the yeah. same video and it takes my whole day up for one post yeah and i can't think about other things i want to do <laughs> i can't write it's just it's like you know i got the plan but it, it's it, you know eventually i will do it uh, and, and and I will have that, but it just takes longer than I want. Yeah. Well, it, in short, um, I mean, when I first started and I was running into some of the same problems where like, you're just, you're so split between doing so many different things. Um, I, I learned how to leverage some virtual assistants, uh, and I'll mm -hmm. give you the link for that. Yeah. But you find somebody who's in a different country. <laughs> Fiverr is one place to go, but I've heard can, about Fiverr. You got to sift through a lot of shit, though. Yeah, yeah. That's why, like, if if you know somebody like me that has a, a link on some some virtual assistants that do pretty good work, interesting. Um, I'll, I'm so I'll into that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm and, so into that. 
and you're helping people out there. I mean, the, the, the you pay a lot less for someone in another country, uh, truthfully. Yeah. But you're, you're helping but you're, them out. That $5 goes a long way in Singapore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or wherever they are. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, probably Panama, so, the Philippines. I mean, if, yeah, if, if you weren't, Philippines. if you weren't, uh, having to do some of this stuff, like what, what's the creative process? How do you, are you like, oh, I'm going to like just write something that's really funny or like, is that just you're a funny guy? And so it just comes naturally. <laughs> like, what do you do? Uh, I, <laughs> I, don't I mean, I've heard your story. So I like, I know that sometimes it's just uh, your life is a lot of it's my life. M- majority of it is, m- is my life. So, I don't, I don't uh, just sit down and be like, all right, what's funny? You know, I don't do that per se. I do sit down. Oh, okay, so I'll live my life. I'll go through the day. Here, here let's just use a great example of something that happened. Uh, let's see. Where are my jokes? All right. Last thing. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. So I'll write. Let me choose a different one. But. I'll, I'll write a thought down of just living my life. So a dude outside of my, my show on Fairfax at Cantor's Deli, this homeless guy, at, who I see a bunch. His name's Terry. He's a great dude. Uh, and he goes, hey, Brent, l- l- let me get a loan real quick. And I was like, a loan? How are you going to pay me back, Terry? Where am I going to send these bills to? To what home? So what I'll do is I'll write this information down, you know, and I just put a couple thoughts. Are you going to pay me back with soda cans what are you gonna like how's this gonna work uh and then i will take that information and i will sit down and i'm like okay now let's develop this so that is a thought that is not developed as we can all tell from how (laughs) not funny it was it was interesting at first here's another good example um i'm actually trying to sell this joke um i find it interesting that there are only two two groups of adult men that use the term daddy in public it is gay men, and it is proud Southern men. And both of them are very different people. and They mean very different people when they say, my daddy. And if you watch like wrestling promos or uh, country music or my Uncle Brock, like they all call them their father daddy. All of them. Uh, it's a Southern thing. And, uh, so that, that idea, uh, and, and then I go through a bunch of different examples where I use the term daddy in a phrase in both voices, basically. And (laughs) so that's where it's at now. Uh, but it's that kind of stuff. So then I'll sit down with that idea that came to me wherever, and I will write out that, um, if I do like information, my podcast, I'll do, I'll have a news story. I'll read it. Because now the idea is there already. I don't have to generate an idea. I take an existing thing. I go through it. And how I do it, and this is different for everybody, is I ha- I take a white sheet of, of printer paper, no lines, and I just write thoughts, things, stuff. It's almost like a spider web or a splurge. And then, uh, and then as I'm just writing stuff, something else will get linked, and then something else will kind of pop up. And then I'm re- and then I have to get tiny at the very bottom. Uh, because now I've got the idea and then it just takes a matter of uncorking that bottle and letting it slowly come out before it really starts flushing, like flooding out. You know what I mean? I don't know if that made sense. Yeah. No, you do it like a brain dump. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, and then I'll, and then I'll read it through and I'm like, okay, this is funny. This is funny. This is funny. And I'll star those and I'll put what order should these go in? Cause I might have something that I wrote at the very end that needs to start the joke because now I know where the whole where the idea is and is going to finish, so I'm like, okay, well, this is going to start the joke. So I'll do one, two, three, four, five, whatever, and then I'll take it to a show and I'll do it and I'll record it and I'll listen to it or I'll just note it right there. Okay, this didn't work, and I'll try it a couple times in its full form. And nine times out of ten, my first jokes are very long winded and very choppy, and then just over time, it just kind of gets chopped down and whittled down. And then it's, you know, is it A game or is it B, you know, like B set? You talked about selling in jokes. What what's what's the business of that? Like, how do you do that? Uh, you just find yourself in it. 
all of a sudden. Uh, I, I'm not in it. There's one guy that I know that, you know, will, will buy ideas or, or jokes and then he'll make them the, his. Um, and it's mostly because he tours arenas all the time. So, you know, when you have folks paying 60 to $180 a ticket, when are you going to work your new material? So you're basically paying other comics to work material for you. And I and I'll write jokes specifically for him that aren't that aren't that I feel like are in his voice. And then I'll smash them in my set. Uh, sometimes I'll announce it. I'm like, these are all new jokes. I don't know how to get in or out of them, but here they are. And I'll just set up punchline. It's very like night late night monologue, you know, for, for the new jokes. And then and you just go from there, and if they want, and then you s- submit them. This person likes them uh, taped, so I'll tape it, and I'll send them a clip. Some people just want the thing. It's just like 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 writing on a night show, on a nightly show, or any comedy show at all. You're just writing jokes, and then you're submitting shit, man. For I think for Fallon, they're writing like fifty to a hundred jokes a day. It's nuts. Like they're just <clears throat> they're just machines, and it's just all at that point. It's all you have to get prompted. You have to get, and they'll have researchers that go search news stories and whatever, and then you'll get like a big breakdown of a bunch of different story of like hundreds of stories, um, and then you just start going through them. And and from what I've heard, you get into a rhythm of like, you know, you can tell from the if it doesn't come to you like within the headline and a couple sentences into it, it's probably not going to come to you. So you just move on. Especially when you have to have volume that much. Yeah. Uh, And then, you know, it just depends. Like you can get, he offered to buy one of my jokes and I was like, nah, that's not enough money. And it's not that great of a joke, but it's one of my favorite jokes to tell. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, it's not worth 300 bucks. I'll give you, I mean, I'll, I'll give it to you for a thousand, but, I got a friend that didn't want to sell him a joke, and he ultimately paid three grand for it. So, okay, so... For that, seven words. In that scenario, really? Mm-hmm. What are the seven words? It's it, You'll be able to tell who it is. So I'm not going to tell you. I'll tell you after the, the okay. recording. All right, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I don't want to out him. So, I mean, it's not no, no, uncommon no. So, for comics to buy material, and it's it's also not uncommon for them to do all their own. Uh, but you know, the, the, the thing is when you're a touring comic and you're always doing the road, this dude is doing 90 concerts a year. That's a shit. Like when, when are you going to write mater- work material? Yeah. If you're a star like that and you go into the comedy store, you know what you're, you're going to do 20 of brand new thoughts. Fuck no. Then you're going to get people tweeting. No, oh, he sucked. He's not, he's lost his edge. That's interesting. I never thought about it like that. Wait, so, Okay. Some dudes have their openers so somebody, as their as their writers. So somebody somebody buys your joke and then you're not allowed to use it anymore. Correct. Yeah, okay. you sign a thing. And then what what if you show them your joke, and then they don't buy it from you, but then they like steal it? Like how do you how does that work? Uh, typically it's not worth their a ding on their reputation to to get the joke to have prompted you to send them a joke. They see it, say no, and then go steal it. They they're too big at that point to do that. Now, like if you're writing for a roast, if you're because a lot of times with those things like the comedy central roast and stuff like that, people will get um, hit up. So then they'll have like the main staff, and then they'll have that staff will like reach out to other writers and then those writers unbeknownst to everyone else will reach out to other writers. So like that's where I get hit up is at the very, 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 very bottom. Cause I'm not in that world yet. And I'm also not, I'm not like a joke machine like that. Mine are all very long, but I'm trying to get better anyway. Uh, so then I pitch a joke to so-and-so he's like, Oh, okay. That's funny. Uh, Maybe and it just gets in his in his filter and it's in his you know bucket of jokes that these other comics sent and then he's gonna send those jokes up to the next person that next person will then send them up to the next person who says yes or no so if it said yes then this person might not even fucking know that the other that the joke they got was used hmm. 
uh, and then they have the you know they can pay him or not, or some people just like all right, that's pretty cool. I'm, I'm gonna take that. You know, it's just at that point the scene hopefully will heal itself and will take care of itself at that point and bring that. Plus, you have email transactions. It's not like you you rarely will tell someone verbally a joke. Gotcha. If you're trying to pitch it to them, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. So then, for for someone like I don't know, maybe I just don't even know what's going on, but for like Dave Chappelle who comes on and does like it's a all Netflix, his. a Netflix show, right? Mm-hmm. But is he touring? Is he testing those jokes out first? Yeah, he just- he's he's a different entity. There's a couple people. Bill Burr is like that too. A lot of these guys will go to um, like like Dave Chappelle is a great example. When Dave came started to- doing comedy again, uh, he came. I'll never forget this. He came to Comedy Works and did seventeen shows in a row, and a lot of them were like two, three hour, four hour shows, um, and. I watched maybe six or seven of them. I watched a lot of them. They were all different. Some of them had the same theme. You could tell he was working some shit out. But it was pre. It was the Dave he was trying to become that he is now. And it was really fun watching that transition fr- from who Dave was pre-Chappelle show, who Dave was during Chappelle show, and who Dave was right after Chappelle show when he left. And then when he came back. And uh, and then watching him transition into how he does comedy now, which is way different from how he did it when he's back in the day, and um, he is uh, he would come to the comedy works and just work stuff, and then he'd go to like I think he goes to Acme, he goes to the Dayton Funny Bone too because he lives n- you know near there in um, Ohio, and he'll pop in at the store. He pops in at clubs last minute, super low down, so you have like. 12 hours to buy tickets before the show starts. And then he, he it's that expectation of he's doing whatever he wants. And that's pretty cool to see for sure. And that's how he works material. Cause like, I remember when he was working this last special, he just, just put out, uh, which I loved. Um, and it was so fun to watch the hipsters and indie scene just lose their mind over it. These cowards. Um, they're God, they're so not funny. And I'm glad I'm on the record saying that. But uh, they, uh, it was fun watching him work that set at Comedy Works. Because I will always watch him live. Uh, and I will watch him, because I've seen him so much live, I'll watch him uh, on an edited format. Because I don't really like watching specials. Because I don't want to hear something and accidentally you know, get it locked in my brain. And then four years later, a year and a half later, I'm like, oh, this is a fun idea. You, you know, and it's not even my idea. Uh, but I'll watch him because I want to see how his delivery is and how they edited it, knowing how knowing how I know he is live. And especially because he was actually working pretty close to this set then at Comedy Works. And it, that was fascinating to watch, for sure. But he can go out and work material. So a lot of comics do. A lot of big stars do go out okay. and work material. But, you know, it's not... Some comics buy my jokes. It just depends on who they are. Who are some of the people that influenced you? Or that you look to for inspiration? Or like, does it work like that? Yeah. Uh, I'll start with the big stars, and then I'll move down to the, like my local people when I was young. Uh, so when I was super young, it was Chris Farley. And then it was super, and I'm not afraid to admit this, it was super early Dane Cook. I'm talking like when he wore that black tank top on his half-hour special and poured water all over his head. No one knows what jokes he told, but he did that snake thing where he poured water on his head and he slithered. It was nuts. And he walked on tables when he walked into the show. You know, uh, that guy, uh, first comedy special, Carlos Mencia uh, for the half-hour special. Uh, and then it moved on to, from there, my dad was like, all right, you like comedy. Then he bought me, uh, two priors, two Murphy's, uh, a Carlin and a Seinfeld, um, and a danger field. And then, um, and then my biggest influences of all is Patrice O'Neill followed by Bill Burr. For sure. No question in my mind. It's Patrice. If I could be like Patrice in in a lot of ways, 
Boy, that'd be great. But he, uh, I wish he was still around today to be to be Patrice in 2019. Because boy, that'd be he'd be straightening some 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 shit out. It'd be pretty cool. Uh, and then like local dudes, like there were dudes like Ben Roy uh, in Denver that just it, it's a lot of high energy comics. Like that's how I think a show should be headlined. When you're headlining a show, you should be the one that's like it's so apparent that you should be this and in, in this role. Um, you know, comedy, it's just you up there. So you're standing there with a microphone and a stool. To me, I'm like, make it visually interesting. As much as I love Mitch Hedberg, you know, he just, the, the way he made it, he's actually a bad example because the way that he made it visually interesting is how he looked and how he like was almost anti-movement. You know, but I look at some comics that are just normal people that just stand there and talk to you. And I'm like, all right, you're funny, but I'm in a dark room in, in, in AC right now and I'm ready to take a nap. <laughs> so it's, what what's still exciting you about this industry? <laughs> Honestly, the only thing that I'm still excited about is the potential at, at this point. This industry is. Uh, I'm in a weird place. You do it for a long time, you know, and it, anytime you turn a hobby into a job, it loses that allure, you know? And, uh, so the potential of growth is what's the most exciting for me. And like figuring this puzzle out, how do I, find a way to to get my because i don't just want fans i don't want people just watching my stuff and i want people to be like and this is gonna bite me in the ass as it always does but i want people to obsess i want people to be like i want to know who you are all the time you know there's people i follow on instagram that i'm i feel like i know them more and more and uh you know that's a commitment on my end that i haven't made to them yet because it's also kind of scary because YouTube fans can get kind of nuts. So it's it's creating those raving fans. Yeah, it's creating those fans and giving that like having folks ap- like appreciate the things cuz at this point it's it's you know, I'm funny, so it's just like how do you, how do I want to nurture myself? What do I want to create cuz it's just a matter of just creating now. Just go put stuff out there for people. And be excited about what you're making. Because at the end of the day, you have to go home and sleep on what you made. And, uh, you know, having the confidence to put your name out there and put your product out there. That's pretty exciting. And, um, you know, it sounds so stupid, but just growing and getting better and getting, you know, getting into this scene more and more because you know hollywood is the mecca of entertainment but it's still a scene just like denver is just like austin is just like atlanta portland and new york it's still a scene and you still have the scenesters and you still have people that you have to you know work around here and impress here that won't mean shit in iowa but it certainly makes you happier and better here in your home you know so it's uh it's just a fun puzzle to figure out, you know. In five years, where do you see yourself? Where do you want to be? In five years, I could see my. <laughs> in five years, I could see myself. <laughs> this is so weird. I could see myself doing national TV commercials, uh, which is weird that I went with commercials first instead of like a show. Uh, but I could see, like, in five years, realistically, I'd like to have a solid internet show that I've cho- that I've for the right reasons chosen to keep on the internet or not it could be you know TV but I feel like having that full control over it that's when your fans are like yeah I'm in I'm in because this is not touched by anyone but you and that's that's fun so I could see in five years having a show um, you know doing the small theaters on my own not having to go taken in the ass by these comedy clubs that are like, well, we don't know who you are, so you get 1500 bucks. Eesh. All right, well, give me 70% of the door. 
<laughs> I'll take my 6,000, you know. All right. Um, I got one more thing I want to ask you. So oh, you have, also, oh, uh, right. uh, uh, happy. <laughs> happy, okay. I'd love to be happy in five years. Yeah. Well, I hope I hope that happens for you. Soon. I mean, I'm pretty happy, but I'm like not though sometimes. So that'd be pretty cool. That's, we could do a whole another podcast about yeah. that. But you're smiling right now. So I am smiling. I'm for sure smiling. <laughs> like I said that kind of as a joke, but it was you know we all have things we're not happy about, and I think that uh, if I can get control over my mind, sometimes I'll be I'll be better. Do you have uh, a favorite book that you buy for people or that you recommend to people the most? <laughs> no. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but that's not a good self-help book. It felt like you were trying to get a self-help book. No, no, no. It could be anything. I mean, my favorite book is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's just a fun series. It's a fun read. It has some stupid life like advice in there. Like, always bring a towel. Boy, that's helped me a lot. <laughs> It really has. It's just so stupid. It really has. Okay. Um, that wraps up everything that I got to ask you. Uh, that was it? That's it. That's all I got for you. Oh, but man. Tell me, what, was that interesting? Do, do people care about comedy that much? I don't know. You know, so like my, my whole thought with this, uh, and this came to me as I was talking to you, actually, but I've been trying to think like, I, I love talking to business with, about, or about business with people. Um, and like, Really, like, I've always, when I talk to people about their jobs, I'm always like, I wish I could just go to work with you for one day and, like, see what you actually do. Because people would say things to me. I'm an analyst. I'm a consultant. I'm a, you know, this and that. And I'm like, what does that even mean? Well, yeah, you know? for sure. Um, and so this is fun for, for me, at least, to talk to people about, like, what what is their job really? Like, yeah. what, what is it like being there for a day? If I spent a day with you, what would it be like? It's hilarious when <laughs> people are like, what do you do all day? I'm like, oh, God, where do we start? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but I don't know. I, I'm interested in that, so I, I think I think other people are. I don't know. Hopefully, We've they yet do. To see. People don't seem to. I mean, I, hopefully, I set the record straight on comedian on like what we do. Again, some people are lazy and just hang out all day. Uh, but you know, if you're not famous, you got to go make money or go get a job. That's right. I don't want a job. I already had a job. <laughs> I saved money from that job, so I didn't have to have a job. All right, so where do they find you so you can make some money and, and make some people laugh? So here's where laugh. you can find me. Uh, you can find me uh, on my YouTube channel, uh, which is just Brent Gill, B-R-E-N-T-G-I-L-L. -L, two L's and I and a G. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram. I'm very active on Instagram at I am Brent Gill <laughs> on Instagram. Uh, and then of course my website, brentgillcomedy.com. Um, I don't tweet much. And when I do tweet, it's just the same stuff I put on Instagram and Facebook. So, uh, but follow me on my YouTube channel, follow me on my Instagram. I put a lot of fun videos up there. Comedy videos, my podcast, I do in video form as well. And I got live videos that I do a bunch as well. And then, uh, and then if you want to, you can help support me put out more videos and hire an editor and you can be the first person to subscribe to my Patreon because I'm at zero still. <laughs> it's uh, uh, I, I think no one wants to be the first one to do it. So I'm like thinking about setting up a burner account and just being my own first person. First customer on Patreon. I don't tell care. Tell I don't care. Secrets. Uh, but eventually I'll get it and I just wanted to have it like set up now. Uh, but it's just five bucks and if you sign up for the first the first hundred people that sign up for it are grandfathered in for life. So no matter how I change the whatever, they will get the most out of every tier for that first five bucks. Boom. That's there pretty good. Is. That gave him something. There it is. Eventually, I'm going to have like a $10 tier where I have extra content, but you can just give me five. I'm on it. I'm going to be the first one. Fuck yeah, Santo. That's what I'm talking about. I got you. So yeah, right. I am Brinkill on, on Instagram. YouTube is uh, Brinkill Comedy. No, just Brent Gill. It's something like that. You'll find me. Follow this guy so you can say you knew him back when. That's true. All right. I'm going to monetize my videos so I can also make money there. There you go. <laughs> my brother. Thank you. I, I wish. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank I wish you. that last part was funnier because it was in my head, but <laughs> it was not. So, All right. Let's go work on the shoulder blade. Let's do it. All right.